passage today is going to be one that uh, will <clears throat> cause you to think. I'll tell you. It comes from Matthew's Gospel, the 12th chapter, the first eight verses. This is a very important chapter in the Bible. Listen now for God's word to you this day. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck some heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, the scribes too, they said to him, Look, Jesus, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He, Jesus, said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, that I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord to which we say, Thanks be to God. Loving God, we ask now, <clears throat> amid those difficult words and our thinking through the years about those words, that you might cause us to reflect upon them on the Sabbath. Few of us can get the Word of God exactly as it should be, Lord, and so I'm asking that the words of my mouth might be something that brings you honor and glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. In September at the session meeting, I posed to the governing body of this church, your leadership, I posed a question. I said, what was Sunday like for you as a child? I'd say the same thing to you today. I, your leadership had, a, I thought, a delightful conversation about their days of growing up particularly on Sunday. I think they could all recall these session members with great detail what Sundays were like. Most session members said that the stores were closed on Sunday and you were to go to church. Church attendance was expected every Sunday in most communities. Sunday school was a must as well. People dressed up when they went to church. No jeans, oh my goodness. No shorts either. You wouldn't dare. And after church, in many a household, there was a large Sunday dinner. And a person was expected to partic participate in that meal and then for the remainder of the day, kind of rest. Read your Bible. I mean, TV wasn't really around in most cases. No such thing as DVDs. Kids in the area are going, what? How were your days of growing up on Sunday? Well, I can certainly identify with what the session said. Growing up in Minnesota in the 60s, Sunday would begin with my dad rising very early in the morning before sunup to put a huge roast, a seven-bone one, after braising it in a Dutch oven and putting it in the oven. He would add potatoes and carrots and onions and water, and soon it would be cooking. Now the whole house, therefore, on Sunday morning would smell incredibly good. Oh gosh, the aroma of seared beef is what I, what I woke up to on Sunday mornings. And Dad would, you know, after he would get it all fixed and put in the oven, he'd go to the foot of the stairs and yell, Hey, it's time to get up! Two hours to church. Every Sunday, we didn't miss one. With that, our home was aroused. Seven of us would scramble to the first floor 
for the one bathroom and one sink that was in our house. My, how things have changed. We'd put on our Sunday best, and we would pass inspection by mom before leaving, and somehow the Mueller family, two girls and three boys, would all make it to church on time. Whether it was snowing or cold or humid and hot, the Mueller's were always on that side of the church, the Missouri Synod Lutheran side of the church halfway back every Sunday. There was really, truth be told, though, nothing else to do on Sunday mornings in Elmore, Minnesota. All the stores were closed, including the gas stations. There weren't many stores in Elmore anyway, a grocery store and a hardware store. And the nice elderly ladies that lived in and around our home watched, I think, if we attended church. And since Dad was a businessman in town, there was extra pressure to attend. To make church attendance even more compelling, there was no Sunday paper. The local Elmore Eye was published on Fridays. There was no Starbucks or Panera for a quick pick-me-up, going to church, and then partaking of the roast at noon was about the order of the day. You had to stay dressed up. Gosh, we were going to eat in the dining room with water goblets and cloth napkins. Sundays were a bit different than they are today for me. They were certainly slower. They were a bit more uptight because I also had to be on guard, careful about the way I looked and what I said. Never more was this true than on Sunday morning dinner when dad would invite a couple of the elderly ladies who had lost their husbands and didn't have anywhere to go for Sunday dinner. Having an eight-year-old show up at the dining room table with guests put, well, dad put the fear of God in me, to be honest with you. My brother Cal was responsible for me. He'd watch me chew, make sure that I wasn't too loud. He was watching how much I put on my plate. And if things got a little out of control, Mom was watching. And Dad was always on the prowl. His look communicated everything. Now, in reflecting upon those days in your life on Sunday, on my life on Sunday, there was an incredible formality to it. Sundays were high, holy days. I wouldn't describe them as fun, but as a way of life. Those days were restful. But we believe that we were honoring God in doing little on Sunday. We were keeping the Sabbath. And I think that's all well and good. Please hear that today. But my growing up days, your growing up days, are rather interesting to consider today in light of this text. Our text is found in that epic chapter, the 12th chapter of Matthew. And it contains a series of crucial events for the life of Jesus. You know, in every man or woman's life, there are decisive moments, times, or events upon which one's life can hinge. And it's certainly true of the 12th chapter. To set the stage, the Orthodox Jewish religious leaders of the day are going to make soon a final decision about Jesus. But at this point, they're just suspicious of him. They eventually will reject him. We know that. They will eliminate Jesus because they need to protect their way of life. They need to preserve the religious way of life that they have been so, so firm about. So the first steps toward the cross today, of all things, will involve the plucking of a corn cob on the Sabbath. Now in Palestine, corn was and is a staple crop. It was planted in rows just like it's done today, but the space between the rows was wider than 
perhaps Stan Alling. I know that Stan Alling plants this day. In the Middle East, in the days of Jesus, they planted space. There, were, there was so much space between the rows that you literally walked between them on your way from one location to another. And Jesus and his disciples and the entourage are walking today between some rows of corn. It is the Sabbath. And the disciples are hungry. They want a little snack. And one of them, probably several, pluck some corn from a stalk and they start eating it, passing it around to others in the group. It'd be a quick, easy snack. Now, some of us might say, well, that's stealing. But in the days of Jesus, this was permitted within reason. Deuteronomy told people that. Deuteronomy 23, 25 states, when, people, when you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So it was right there in the law. The same could be said of wheat. There's nothing wrong with plucking a head of wheat, rolling it in your hands, and eating it. The same could be done with corn. The religious leaders were not disturbed by the plucking of the corn, but that the disciples had done it on Sunday. There were... 39 basic actions that were forbidden on the Sabbath. And each of those actions had been carefully defined by the Pharisees and scribes. These are some of them. If you suggested that you might go into work and you told your wife about it, you had violated the law. If you were worried about something on the Sabbath. You had violated the law. If you were carrying a burden, a troubling thing, that was outlawed. And plucking an ear of corn, a form of gathering food on the Sabbath, was forbidden as well. Now that was not biblical in the sense that God had writers write it down, and it was in the Torah. It was an interpretation from the religious leaders that people were to follow. For the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus and his disciples had reaped. They had broken the law of God. And in that day, if you broke the law of God there would be some form of punishment. Death was on the table in some instances. So the scribes and the Pharisees, they're going to confront Jesus, and they do. They come up to Jesus and say, Look, Jesus, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. Jesus disagreed. He challenged them. Sides now had been chosen. The battle would begin and Jesus begins his response in the form of a threefold defense. And it's fascinating to watch this guy work. He persuasively, I think that's his leadership style to begin with, tries to convince people that he and his disciples have done nothing wrong, that the Pharisees' interpretation of the Sabbath is what's wrong. And Jesus begins by saying first, let's talk about David. Now David was an icon in that day. He was like Abraham and Moses. He was up there. And Jesus tells this story of David breaking into the temple with his group. They're hungry. They see some bread on the table, bread that has been consecrated for the priests that was on display for everyone to see. And David and his companions take it and they eat it. And to make matters even worse, they get away with it. David and his group are not punished. Jesus says, what about this? Or he goes on to say, what about, what about pastors? What about priests that have to work in the temple? The temple on Sunday was the busiest day of the week. 
two, three, and four times the amount of work needed to be done, killing the animals, directing people to the proper place, telling them what to say. It was all hands on deck. And Jesus says, not only did you forget about David and not deal with him, but every Sunday there's a violation of, of this law. Well, we can only guess how that was received by the scribes and Pharisees. My guess is it had little to do, didn't do much to change them. It probably made them mad. But I think Jesus is just saying that stuff to get to this last point, and it is a doozy. In other words, he's just saying David, and he's just talking about the temple workers on Sunday to loosen these Pharisees and scribes a little bit, to get them talking to each other, and then he launches this bomb. He sends this missile into the eyes and hearts and souls and minds of the Pharisees and scribes on this third point when he begins to unveil for the religious leaders of the day the basic nature of the God we serve. Jesus claimed that God was a God of mercy, not sacrifice, not law-keeping. That God is a God who at God's very heart desires to meet the needs of those who are suffering. To respond to human need. In other words, it's not about dressing up and insulating ourselves from the the world on Sunday morning. Less emphasis is placed on rules and more on the invitation to join the group as you demonstrate every Sunday in the passing of the peace. That is the kingdom of God at work. And some of you are saying, oh, I don't know if I buy that, Pastor Mark. But everywhere you go in the Bible, it is about Jesus seemingly doing something on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon. I was reading this week as I'm reading through the Bible again in the 19th chapter of, or the 19th verse of the 13th chapter of Luke. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully strengthen herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are free from your disability. And, they lay, and he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the rulers of the synagogue, here we go, indignant, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which you work, which your work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, but not on the Sabbath. (laughs) Jesus said, you come on the Sabbath as well. 14th chapter of Luke, verse 1. On the Sabbath, he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees. And they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man with him who had dropsy, kind of an inflammation in the various joints of the body. Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now he asks them the question. And they say no. Jesus says yes. Less emphasis on rules. More emphasis on joining. More emphasis on helping others. More emphasis on relationships. People over procedure. Marginalized over power. Hungry over well-fed. Have-nots over haves. This radical Jesus caused everyone in that day, and I think this day as well, to think about their actions as a demonstration of their love. We've heard it before, and surprisingly, the scribes and Pharisees knew it too. Heavens, Jesus even quoted from Hosea the prophet, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice. That means you care for the orphan, the widow, and the stranger every day on Sunday too. It means you go out in the world and find the need and address it, even on Sunday. And you don't worry about whether or not you've picked a corn cob and eaten it on the Sabbath. Love is defined in the Bible, mind you, in 1 John. 
By this we know love, that he laid his life down for us, that we ought to lay our lives down as well for our brothers and sisters. But if anyone has worldly goods and sees his brother or sister in need, yet closes his heart against him or her because of the Sabbath, how does God's love abide in him or her? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth, even on Sunday. But you see, the Pharisees and the scribes, they had built their empire on power and control, and they were destined to protect it and keep it that way. And today, Jesus stormed the castle. But my dear friends in Christ Jesus, Jesus storms our castle too. The living word of God is a directive today. Human need is the focus of what we help to alleviate every day. Elaborate buildings and nicely dressed people are not the desired goal. Sorry, Mom and Dad. Our call to worship is really a call to serve. And this is probably where I'll, prob I'll start stepping on some toes, but these seem apropos to me. You can send me the emails. I'll take the hit. A mission focus of 10% of the budget, which I think is proposed this year, is a great step. What would Jesus think of it? Jerry Cars, your heart rate just went up, I think. Homeless ministry. We should have every one of those slots filled out the first time we present the list. But it's but a tip of the iceberg. Clean bathrooms, Dan, Val, they're important. But they can't be the focus of what we do and what we're about. So what is, you say, human suffering, human need, merciful people? You know, with the exception of the synagogue in Nazareth, we have no evidence that Jesus ever conducted a worship service in his life on earth. Yet we have abundant evidence that he fed the hungry, that he comforted the sad, and he cared for the sick every day. Christian service is not, in my opinion, about men wearing ties and women wearing dresses on Sunday. It is not about proper liturgy either. It is about service to meet human need. It is in the involvement in the tragedies and problems and dilemmas found in the human predicament. I think that's what Jesus would have inferred when we come to church and hear, let us worship God. He'd want us to hear, let us serve. I've told you that I've come back from an Outreach Foundation <clears throat> board meeting in Tulsa. And, and I came this close to going on a trip in November to, to uh, Ethiopia. Little did I realize that in South Sudan, because of the turmoil in that country, between 380 and 450,000 people are in refugee camps in Ethiopia. The greatest need right now is that the people receive trauma healing because of what they've been through. I didn't think I could go on that trip given <clears throat> that there's a wedding in our family and also the birth of the first grandchild. Toby would probably disown me. But on the horizon, too, is a trip to the Middle East and to the refugee camps in Jordan. Now we hear of all the trouble with Sabania Church and the no longer granting of visas by the United States to Cuba. 
Then you hear of all the refugee camps in Burma. Heavens, that's just global need, let alone all the need in our local community. There is so much need in the person that Jesus wants to help is you. Some of us can't because we're not physically able anymore. But folks, we have the resources. There's never been a wealthier country or a wealthier denomination than the Presbyterian Church in the United States right now. So I pray that you give to mission, and I pray that you give it heartily to local and globally, but I pray also that you get involved. Because that's what Jesus is talking about in the text today. I desire mercy. Not sacrifice. To God be the glory.